optimism design issue. Okay, so hopefully now I'm sharing screen and let me start to talk. Okay, um, if there's a technical glitch, please let me know, but I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to uh, give this talk to a broad audience. Uh, nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm a machine learning researcher. Um, that's a blend of statistics and computer science. And I've realized finally after several decades of working in the field, what's missing in the field. And that's essentially, I'm going to argue in this talk, an economics perspective. And I want to tell you why I think that's important and missing. And then what kind of research flows if you add economics into the to the mix of pattern recognition and statistics. Um, so I, I'm assuming that most of you have heard of machine learning or, or are machine learning researchers or work with it. Um, it really is statistics, but done at very large scale with new kinds of data sets. And it is uh, focused in recent years, maybe say decade on, on the field of pattern recognition or predictive modeling, if you will. Um, you know, partly because uh, there's so much data that you can use it to feed these uh, these algorithms. They're they're just gradient descent algorithms at large scale, um, but that scale has seemed to kind of unleash new powers. And uh, platforms um, such as TensorFlow and PyTorch have made it a commodity, so anyone can, you know, download the platform and be up and running very quickly and start to fit data uh, data sets. Um, and uh, so, the, you know, the latest round of this is ChatGPT, which you probably all heard about. Um, and I won't get into the you know, evaluation of that, but just to say that it is really limited in the sense it's a pattern recognition system. It takes massive amounts of data and finds patterns in them. And uh, are those patterns useful or good or bad? Well, it just kind of depends on the data. And um, what's missing, even if, the, even if the data is good and useful and all that, is a focus on decision making. Uh, so in the real world, um, in science and engineering, and especially I'm going to argue in engineering, the decision-making side is equally important to the pattern recognition or predictive modeling side. And if you neglect it, you're going to make big mistakes and make people unhappy. Um, so we're going to focus on decision-making. I'll kind of give an anecdote uh, on the next slide to kind of get us into that uh, way of thinking. But, you know, a lot of the pattern recognition work and, and predictive modeling has focused on low stakes decisions, predicting the next word in a sentence or deciding whether there's a, um, a rabbit in the image or something. Uh, no one's going to live or die if you make an error. Um, but, it, you know, there's going to be lots of problems. There are lots of problems emerging where the stakes are high, where, it, you know, it's a medical decision or it's a commercial decision or it's a, uh, um, yeah, some kind of, um, you know, personal decision. Um, and so life, it could be a life or death decision, or it could be something that affects many, many millions of people. So it's not enough just to look at uh, thresholding of outputs of neural network systems. Uh, and, you know, moreover, we're going to need explanations for decisions. That's part of the decision making side, not just pattern recognition. And then particularly, we're going to have to worry about multiple decisions and uh, multiple decision makers. Um, when I make a decision, it's never in isolation. It's always with uh, my own other decisions of mine, but also other decision makers. And when you have multiple decision makers, you really start to have to talk about market mechanisms in one way or another. And we haven't really had that dialogue enough. Okay, so let's just take this little kind of almost anecdote, if you will, kind of to start our uh, discussion of this. Um, here's a decision making situation. You're in the room with the doctor, maybe in two or three years. And uh, the doctor has at to, you know, access to a very big predictive modeling system uh, that has all of the world's medical data. Let's just kind of be science fiction and imagine that really everything has been collected from every hospital and every doctor, and it's been put into a big predictive modeling system. Uh, so that, mo that system is able to take in data about you that's measured in the moment, um, your height, your weight, your blood pressure and all, but, but your genome and, and many other things about you. Uh, so that's its input, and then its output is predictions of all of the things that could go wrong with you, all of your health state. So, for example, one of the predictions might be uh, whether or not you're about ready to have a heart heart attack. Um, and it's a prediction in the sense that, you know, there's going to be a threshold value, um, say 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And above that value, uh, based on the historical data, it seems like you're about ready to have a heart attack and you better have an operation. Uh, so let's suppose that uh, you go in and your measurement is 0.71. Uh, 
Um, so you're above the threshold, um, but you don't really believe this prediction necessarily just at, at face value. You, you need to you start to have a dialogue with the doctor and you start to think through the consequences of this uh, test result. Um, it's not a decision. So you'll say things like, um, uh, oh, I, you know, I, I now now that this is an issue, I remember but one of my parents had heart disease and I, I forgot to talk about that ever before. Um, or I had asthma when I was a child. I never mentioned that as well. Um, and you'll also kind of ask questions about, you know, uh, counterfactuals. You know, what if I were to exercise more or what if I were to uh, uh, eat better or something? Um, and so you realize that that predictive engine doesn't have any of this information in it. Uh, it, it just has past data and it, it's missing the data about your parent or about your asthma as a child. And it, and it can't just do counterfactuals. It, it, you know, it, you, so you have to you know, put other queries into it about things that could happen in a different world than the world, world we're in. Um, and so that's, that's the process of reasoning. And you're going to do this with the doctor. There'll be a dialogue. The doctor will say yes and no to certain things, uh, rule in and rule out. Um, and you'll start to kind of figure out a plan. Um, you'll, um, you know, you'll decide maybe to get a second opinion. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll think about various courses of action. And then also you're going to ask more questions about the data. Um, you're going to say, well, was the data really collected on people like me? And how old is the data uh, for this particular prediction? Uh, is it 10 years old? Is it recent? Uh, was it done on machines that are different than the one used for me and so on? And a good doctor will be able to answer all those kind of questions. And you'll start to really form an idea of the uncertainty in this predictive engine and the consequences of that uncertainty and, uh, you know, uh, counterfactuals, things that you, you need to think about. So provenance, counterfactuals, relevance, and all. So this is all part of the decision-making side of data science. Uh, it's unfortunately not talked about nearly as much as the big predictive engines kinds of things. But I can sort of, I hope you can see in this situation uh, it's it's critical. It's it's as least as important as the prediction. Now that's just one decision. Um, we're going to make multiple decisions in our in our in our daily life. Um, today I'm making many kinds of decisions at many levels of granularity, and they and they all interact. And some of them are today's decisions. And some of them are stretching over uh, days or months or even years. You know, thinking about my career plans or something. Um, so that all starts to interact and get complex, and we have to worry about, you know, calibrating these decisions. Um, but moreover, um, I'm making decisions in the context of other decision makers. Um, we have to synchronize up in some ways, or maybe there's scarcity. We both want the same thing, and we both can't have it. We have to think about fair division and so on. Um, and so far, machine learning has really not faced this very much. They've built systems that... Um, that aren't fair or or, you know, or don't make uh, you know handle scarcity well and allocation well, and then they worry about how to fix up the system to make it better. Um, but really, what you want to do is to think about those problems as part of machine learning. As when I'm making decisions, I'm also making allocations and I'm also interacting with other decision makers, and that's part of the learning system. Um, so let's start to worry about that. Um, so another example that kind of helped bring this home is that to think about recommendation systems. Um, you all know what these are. Uh, when you buy some products, for example, from a website, uh, it'll 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 find patterns in everybody's purchase behavior and it'll make recommendations to you based on what you've already bought. Um, this is important in 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 commerce. It's you know billion dollar uh, impact on productivity, um, and arguably has helped people to find things with it that they want. Uh, it is very much part of the pattern recognition side of machine learning. It finds patterns in data, and it then just kind of uses those patterns in kind of a simple thresholding uh, sense. Um, so that's great. Um, but as with most pattern recognition systems, just making predictions alone is not good enough. You're going to run into troubles. And so let's think about this for a moment. Um, let's suppose that you're making, uh, you're building a recommendation system for something, and, you're, you're, and many people are using your system. So, for example, it's a movie recommendation system. And you recommend a movie to somebody. Um, but if uh, a million people are using your system today, you could easily recommend the same movie to 100,000 people just because it's a good movie or something. And that's not a problem um, because there's no scarcity in the world of streaming movies. You can copy the movie as much as you want. And this is kind of the mindset that people who built these systems have, that there's no scarcity. And uh, so if you recommend the same movie to everyone, it's not a problem even at you know, hundreds of millions of people. Um, same thing with books. So you can recommend, this is the original recommendation system at Amazon, was recommending books to people. 
Um, and if you recommend the same book to 100,000 people today, uh, which I'm sure happens all the time at Amazon, um, that you can copy the book nowadays within one day and ship it to people. It's not a problem. All right. But that's not true of most goods in the real world. If you start recommending things that where there's scarcity, you have troubles. Um, and so you will see this actually in real life. You'll see companies that recommend things like restaurants, and they will just easily recommend the same restaurant to 10,000 people. Um, now, if very few people are using the app, it's not a problem. No one notices this problem. But as soon as an app becomes popular, and you know all of uh, you know the city of Berlin is is um, using this app, uh, you could easily create a, a huge crowd down the street uh, wanting to get into the restaurant because they were all recommended the restaurant. Um, and that's true of most goods in the real world. Uh, recommending streets to driver is another example. Um, you know, I could build a system that predicts what's the fastest route to the airport, and um, and now it has to make a decision. So you go in and say, here I am, I want to go to the airport, it'll give you the fastest route. And if it does that to, uh, you know, a million people, we're going to create congestion, and, and we will suddenly no longer have that route being the fastest route, it'll be the slowest route. Uh, so our decision making interacts with other decision makers to create phenomena that uh, can be problematic, or could be favorable. Um, but we have to manage all of that. And that's what the field of economics really tries to do. Um, if you don't do the economics, then you just think of this as kind of a load balancing problem. And you say, okay, I'm not going to recommend this same restaurant to 10,000 people. Um, you know, I'll, I'll cap it at 100. Um, but now the question is, which, which 100 people get to uh, be recommended the restaurant? And uh, there's not a good answer to that. Uh, you, and you can't just assume you know as the platform by, you know, snooping into people's browsing history and deciding which restaurants they prefer. Um, and sadly, that's kind of the mindset right now. Uh, instead, this should be like a market. You should simply provide the opportunities for two sides of a market to connect up. I, if I'm interested in food and I'm in, um, in Shanghai and I've never been there before and I don't speak Mandarin, I just really want to make a bid. I want to push a button on my phone saying I would like to have dinner. And uh, um, and I allow certain things to be known about me. For example, I like Sichuan cuisine and I have a certain price point and a certain location and all. Um, but I don't let everything ab about myself be known. And that loss of privacy gives me a little bit of benefit because the other side of the market now is all the restaurants are going to see my presence and see my bid and they will bid on me. They'll decide, they'll get many bids for many people and they'll decide which people to make offers to. And if they make me an offer, I'll get a, a being on my cell phone and I'll see a particular offer and I'll decide in the moment whether I like it or not. I don't have to do a search on the internet and, and look at advertisements or something. Um, I'm simply connected to the other side of the market via market mechanism. And everybody is done that way. And so it automatically balances. That's what markets will do. Uh, you can't make, the restaurant will not make the same offer to 10,000 people. Um, and same thing with streets and drivers. You could imagine a, a auction or a uh, contract kind of mechanism that is run automatically by your car, for example, to decide whether you're going to go down a street and maybe decide today I'm really in a hurry or today I'm not in a hurry and let the auction proceed based on that. All right, so this is an alternative to think about machine learning deployments. It's not just build big predictive engines and hopefully they'll do good things. It's, um, it's use those engines to support market building to support production, producer and consumer relationships, okay? Um, now, this is not just classical microeconomics or game theory mechanism design. Uh, that is the field of building markets, uh, but that field has very much not been a data science field. Uh, it's not used data to structure the markets. It's not assume the markets adapt by collecting data. Uh, it assumes that all distributions are known, preferences are known a priori, and you simply have to worry about doing the matching. Um, whereas in the learning perspective, uh, those preferences are not known a priori, those distributions are not known, you learn them as part of building the market. Uh, so this is a, in essence, a, a new field of kind of adaptive mechanism design where learning comes together with, with um, markets. And I want to give one more example before I start to turn to research issues. Um, I've been involved in a company called unitedmasters.com, and um, the CEO there is Steve Stout. Uh, he, he's a friend and colleague of mine. Um, he's a legendary uh, hip-hop producer in, in the United States and knows many people in the music industry and the technical industry. And uh, so his idea and mine are very much in correspondence, that the idea of data analysis and data science is to create markets. Um, so musicians nowadays basically there's huge numbers of people making music and huge numbers of people listening 
but there's not a thriving market between those producers and consumers. There's instead a centralized system where musicians will make songs, they'll upload it to some site like SoundCloud, and it's then streamed by a service like Spotify. And Spotify simply takes the music and streams it, and then they make their own money with subscriptions or whatever. And uh, they're not creating a market that links the producer and the consumer. Um, so the musicians basically getting no money, and this is just a fact of our life that musicians are not making money off of their product. Uh, so that's bad. Um, so you can start to fix this with basic data science. Uh, you can say, look, if I'm a musician, I get to, at the end of the week, I see a dashboard of the map of, say, Germany, and I see every time one of my songs has been listened to, there's a dot on the map. And so I might discover um, that in Strasbourg or something, I'm, uh, you know, or I guess that's not Germany, but uh, if I, uh, you know, in Munich, I'm very popular. You know, 10,000 people listened to my my songs last week. Um, and so I, I uh, tell the venue owners, I show the venue owners, uh, look, I'm very popular right now in, in your city. Uh, can you invite me to give a show? And if I go there, I maybe make 10,000 euros. And um, if I do that three times during the year, I start to that starts to become a salary. Um, and then I have other connections to people listening to me and I could like sell merchandise and so on and so forth. So it sort of empowers the musician to sort of have access to the other side of the market and uh, build a business really. Um, but now Steve had a third, third idea, which is this is really a three-sided market. So for example, he went to the National Basketball Association and uh, he said, whenever you're streaming, um, you know, um, games, uh, there's music behind that. And you, right now you're paying, uh, you know, record companies or, or, uh, Beyonce large amounts of money for that music. Instead, why don't you, uh, use the artists and uh, the United masters artists. And, uh, when, when their songs are being listened to, they get paid directly by you. Um, and, and this is a win-win because uh, the NBA now is getting much more fresh music that the younger people are all listening to. Uh, so they're they're getting some value. And then the artist, when their song is listened to, uh, they're getting paid directly. Um, and so it really is a thriving three-way market. And there are over now 2 million musicians who are signed with United Masters. And uh, it really is an alternative to the classical music industry and an alternative to simple prediction systems like Spotify. Okay, so that hopefully was enough motivation to believe that data science should en encompass economics. Um, and now the, the questions become, how do you do this? You know, what, what is the, what, what are market mechanisms and how do you build them in machine learning systems? How do you augment the two fields and bring them together? And so I've been doing this now for about 10 years and uh, I have a large list of kind of problems to work on. And here are some of them. Um, the first one is probably the most important that in machine learning, we often talk about optima and optimization. Uh, in economics, you rarely can get a global optimum. That's kind of, uh, that, that's not possible. So instead you talk about equilibria, like Stackelberg equilibria or Nash equilibria and so on. And that's sort of the, that's what the best you could hope for. Um, but in both fields, what you also need is dynamics. It's not enough just to talk about the end state, you know, talk about the algorithms that arrive at that dynamics. And in machine learning, we have a lot of algorithms that arrive at optima. And in economics, there are algorithms that arrive at equilibria. These tend to be fixed point algorithms but there's sort of less discussion of dynamics. And in any case, there should be a blend of dynamics with data and markets. You get new kinds of dynamics to be studied and analyzed. Um, and then the rest of the list has other topics. We'll be kind of going through, I'm um, gonna give you know, research examples, but things that are involving uncertainty and statistics and uh, algorithms and design uh, and incentives kind of all put together um, uh, to solve uh, you know, real world engineering problems. Let me also notice that fairness and privacy and social good are listed in the list. Um, you know, people often talk about these things as kind of absolutes. You're either private or not, or you're fair, fair or not. Um, and that's not really the, I think the right perspective. It's certainly not the economics perspective. The economics perspective is that these are quantitative qu concepts. If I, I could lose a little bit of privacy, but I'm happy to do that if I get a little bit of economic gain. So like in my uh, recommendation system example, um, and I think that is the right way to think about privacy. It, you know, it's so to, and you can quantify it. Things like differential privacy allow you to quantify it. And then the market ideas allow you to trade that off against gains you might get. So if you ask for my medical data, I may be able to willing to give it to you uh, if you're a medical doctor working on a disease that runs in my family. So I, I choose a high level of private or a low level of privacy. 
Whereas if you're an insurance company wanting my medical data for some other purpose, I maybe have choose a high level of privacy. And so I'm doing kind of cost benefit analysis as I decide how much privacy to retain in a given situations. Same thing with fairness. Okay, so I've kind of assembled a, a, a short list here of topics that I'm going to briefly uh, go through, introduce these, um, just to show you how you could do research that has this bipartite nature, or tripartite nature. Uh, so these ideas will have a core idea in statistics or computer science, and then also together with a core idea in economics being put together. Um, and these are really just examples, and I'm not going to give a huge amount of uh, detail these are all they're all papers on the archive on my publications page about these if you want to follow up and look at uh you know actual algorithms and theorems and and applications and so on but hopefully you'll get the idea from these so let me start with uh this area um called strategic classification this is work with my student tiana zernich and eric mazumdar at berkeley um and so this is the problem where you're trying to do pattern recognition or prediction classification but there are strategic agents involved, okay? So if you ask someone to fill out a health insurance form, they're supplying data to you. You're trying to build a model of who should get health insurance or not, or how much should they pay really. And, um, but the, the person filling out the form uh, knows that if they give certain kind of data, they're more likely to get, uh, you know, a cheap insurance. And so they will um, change the data a little bit. They will not provide the true data they're not incentivized to do so. So if you ask, how much do I exercise? I will probably, you know, naturally give a optimistic answer of how much I would like to exercise, or I may just lie. Or, um, you know, do you smoke or, or drink drink uh, beer or not? You know, I may lie about that. Um, you know, and so this is true in many situations. And it's not that people are bad and they shouldn't lie. It's that that's what they're incentivized to do. And if it's for their family and their, you know, their life, they, they are going to do it. Um, and so the health insurance company, of course, knows this, and they try to make it hard to lie. So if they add, they don't just ask you how much do you exercise. They say things like, "Can we opt into your cell phone and measure accelerations for one day?" And that's like a proxy for how much you exercise. But then people build devices that move cell cell phones around artificially um, to simulate uh, movement. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's a back and forth problem here. This is called Goodhart's law in economics, um, whereas if you take any kind of measurement that people care about, here it's the poverty index score. Uh, after you defined it in 1994, by 2003, the data that was being collected had shifted completely just so that most data was just to the left of the, the median. And why did they do that? Well, now people are kind of lying about their, their poverty so they can be on the right side of the, me of the median so that they can get more benefits. Um, and this this is uh, happens all the time in economics. All right, so in general, we're going to have um, feedback loops in learning, and uh, these loops involve incentives. It's not just you know a control system; it's actually real incentives with real agents. You know, so these agents want a favorable prediction. The decision maker wants to minimize the prediction loss, so that you know they build a good system. But they're getting data which is being altered by the loop, um, so they produce a predictive model. But the agents now look at that model or, or know something about the way it's being built because maybe for regulatory reasons. And since they know that, they're going to supply strategic data that's been altered in ways that they think will get them a better outcome. All right, so that is a game. Um, in economics, these games are called Stackelberg games. That's that's the, the sequential style of game where one side does a best response, then the other side does a best response, and this may iterate. And so this is a statistical Stackelberg game where the best response on one side is to provide strategic data and the best response on the other side is to build a model from that data. All right, so um, we're gonna model this in fact as a, as a Stackelberg game. Uh, the leader um, is the one who moves first and the follower is the one who moves second. And then we're gonna analyze, uh, is it better to be a leader or a follower? And uh, think about that. It's kind of what you often do in game theory, all right? But there's going to be a twist here, which is that we're doing learning. Um, and so we're going to have updates to these models on both sides. All right, so the central decision maker will update a theta vector, and the uh, strategic agents will update their data um, mu. Now, it could be that these are synchronized in kind of a classical analysis, they would be. But in real life, they're not going to be synchronized. There's no reason that you should have the modeling and the data 
provision being synchronized. They're just different, uh, you know, phenomena. All right, so here the um, central decision maker is, is updating the model slowly, whereas the strategic agents are providing the data more asynchronously. Okay, and I'll talk about examples of this in a moment, but you could have it the other way around as well. Okay, so here's the one where the decision maker is slow, and we call these the proactive decision making situation. And an example of this, this happens all the time in real life, is something like college admissions. Um, the college uh, builds a model of who they're trying to, they're, they want to admit. They maybe release aspects of that model so people kind of know uh, what they're looking for. And then people supply applications, data to the colleges, and decisions are made. Now, so why is the decision maker slow here? Well, just for social reasons, they, you know, a college is not going to update their admissions policy after every application is coming in. They wait a couple of years and, and occasionally update it for obvious reasons. Now, you could have the other way around where the decision maker is fast and the agents are slow. And this actually is also very common in real life. This is kind of the IT world um, where decision makers are very, have a lot of computing. And as soon as you uh, have anybody up, you know, interacting with YouTube or something, they update their model to make it more predictive. All right. So now if you start to analyze these dynamics as Stackelberg games that are kind of statistics, Stackelberg games, you learn some interesting things. All right. So first of all, we did some of this analysis and it turns out that um, you get equilibria in this system in either order of play. Okay. Either the central decision maker is fast or the, or the agents are fast, but they're different equilibria. And, and that means economically, there's different social value associated with the two kinds of equilibria. And it turns out that when the decision maker, the central decision maker is going fast and the agents are slow, uh, that gives a lot of welfare to the or revenue to the central decision maker. And it gives little welfare to the uh, strategic agents. Okay. So there's benefit for the central decision maker and not for the strategic agents. Uh, so that's, that's interesting, not too entirely surprising. What's surprising is the other, the second result, which is that if you turn it around and make the decision, central decision maker slow and the agents are allowed to be fast, you get higher social welfare for the agents. That's kind of obvious, but you also get higher social welfare for, for, the, for the central agent, uh, central decision maker. All right, so there's a direction of uh, dynamics, uh, central decision maker slow, that's actually beneficial to both the decision maker and to the strategic agents. So this is kind of unusual for game theory. Usually there's one side wins and the other side loses kind of thing. But here there's a win-win possibility. And it's not true of arbitrary Stackelberg games, but it's true of this uh, special form of statistical Stackelberg game. You know, So when you put learning together with um, game theory, some interesting things can start to happen. All right, so I can go on about that, but I'm not. Um, let me turn to a second topic. Um, I'll try to be relatively quick on this one. Um, this is with Lydia Liu and Horiamani at Berkeley. Um, we're now talking about competing bandits and matching markets. So bandits are a learning architecture, matching markets are an economics architecture. We're going to put the two together. Uh, so multi-armed bandits, I suspect you all know what they are. Um, they're systems where you don't know the, the correct action um, a priori. You have to explore uh, to find a good action. So you get a reward. Um, and you then pick a different arm, you get a different reward, and you make a little model of the rewards. Uh, it's usually done with a large deviation, or confidence bound. And then you pick the arm that has the highest upper confidence bound. That's one particular algorithm. This algorithm is known to have logarithmic regret, meaning relative to an oracle that knew the optimal action a priori, uh, your um, uh, reward is uh, within a logarithmic factor of that. So you, you learn as you explore, you also exploit and have logarithmic regret. So that was on the learning side. On the economic side, matching markets are very important. Um, you have buyers on one side, sellers on the other, and there are preference orderings, assumed known a priori. Um, and so then the algorithms, for example, Gale Shapley algorithm, uh, finds a matching which is stable, okay? It's an equilibrium concept. All right, so what's missing from matching markets is that you're, you're assuming the preferences are known a priori. And in a learning situation, we don't like to think that way. And moreover, it's not realistic in something like a uh, you know, restaurants and diners kind of situation. I don't know the restaurants in Shanghai. I can't have a preference ordering over them. I have to experience them a little bit or maybe be in a social network that helps me to, uh, to have a prior on them. I don't know that the preferences are a priori. Uh, so you have to build the market 
and the match do the matching as you're learning the preferences. Now, what's missing from the bandit case, of course, is there's no market. It's just a learning system. But what if you put the two together? All right. So here we have two agents. They're trying to learn what to do. One of them picks, um, uh, you know, an arm. The other picks an arm. They get a reward. But what if both of them pick the same arm? Well, here's where we start to model scarcity. We assume that only one of the agents will get a reward when they both pick the same arm. Here, the bear got the reward, not the human. Um, and who gets the reward? Well, the arm has preferences on the other side of the market. That's that's what matching markets are. And so we assume here that the arm, for some reason, prefers the bear to the human. The human sees that, and they realize that um, even though they like arm two, they may not win arm two. So they better explore some of the other arms more than they otherwise would. Uh, so that latter statement suggests I have to do more exploration in when there's competition. And um, that would be a higher regret. So competition should lead to a higher regret. Um, and so the question is, what form of higher regret? What should we expect? And so again, cut, cutting to the chase here, here's our notion of regret. I don't want to explain the math here, but uh, the regret, again, is relative to an oracle. This is an oracle that knew the op, the uh, op, the preferences a priori. Um, and uh, we're comparing the amount of reward our system gets to that oracle. So, so we call that the stable regret. And long story short, we're able to get a regret bound that still scales as logarithmic in the number of time steps. So that's what that equation is showing you there. It's logarithmic in N, which is the number of time steps. And everything else are constants and N agents, K arms. Um, and so did the regret actually go up in the comp because of competition? And the answer is yes. So delta squared there reflects the competition. Uh, it's a, a measure of gap between the reward distributions. So if reward distributions are close, um, then delta is small. And then I divide by something small, I get something big. Uh, so it does reflect the regret, but only in a constant term. It's not affecting the logarithmic nature of the learning process. So competition only affects the constant, not the uh, the, the speed of the rate of learning. Um, okay, so that was that story. Again, I'm going to move on somewhat quickly. So I uh, get to the other little brief anecdotes I want to talk about. But uh, there's a lot of research that is going on in the matching markets and bandits domain. Um, and so this is a more this is a very recent project. We call this statistical contract theory with colleagues at Berkeley, and um, this comes from the theory of incentives. Um, uh, you know, we're back in economics again, and um, the theory of incentives has got multiple pieces to it. One of them is auction theory, um, very well known. In fact, there's been some work on learning of auctions, uh, but the other branch is contract theory. And contract theory is this asymmetric principal agent sort of setting where um, a principal wants to get some task done. They can't do it themselves or don't want to. Uh, so there's some agent that they want to incentivize to perform the task. Um, but they have to decide how to incentivize that agent, in particular, how much to pay them. And partly it depends on how good the agent is, how much the agent knows, how much resources the agent has and all. And the principal can't just ask the agent about that because the agent, again, is motiv not motivated to tell the truth. Um, they want to get a high price, so they will probably lie. Um, and the principal knows this, uh, so they have to somehow structure the interaction to still get out a truthful answer. All right. And you all know about this because uh, this happens all the time in lots of real life situations behind the scenes. So airlines don't have a single fare. They have business fares and economy fares and many other fares. And the reason they're doing that, of course, is because they'd like to ask you, what is your willingness to pay? Uh, if you want to go from, uh, you know, Rome to Stuttgart, you, you uh, maybe you're in a real hurry. It's really important to get there. Or maybe you're a business traveler and you got lots of money. You'll pay a thousand euros. If the airline knew that, they'd charge you a thousand euros. Uh, but if they charge a thousand euros to everyone, they'll only get a few travelers and they won't fill their airplane. Um on the other hand, if they charge 100 euros to for everybody, they'll get their airplane full, but they'll miss out on the opportunity to have charged 1,000 euros to some people. And so, um, you know, this is part of economic theory. You've lost surplus. And so the answer is that you don't try to figure out who would pay more. That's called price discrimination. It's illegal. Um, but instead, you offer a menu of options to everyone. And it's the same menu to everybody. And so what you're giving is higher services to certain, if people pay more, and that's called a business class fare. And the services are not that, not, not really worth it. 
Uh, it's a little glass of red wine and, and access to the airplane more, uh, before everyone else. And the travelers in the back are more than happy not to have those services and pay a lot less. And the travelers in the front are happy to pay for those services and um, you know pay a lot because they you know really are in a hurry. So anyway, you've allowed people to self-select and you've got overall social welfare being high and revenue by being high. So there's a theory of this. Uh, and again, what's missing in that theory is there's no data analysis. It's it's basically not a learning system. It's based on assuming uh, all the preferences known a priori and then structuring the contract based on your knowledge. All right. So here's an example of where that breaks down, where you want to have uh, real learning going on. So in the U U.S., the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, uh, runs clinical trials to decide what drugs go to market. Uh, so the, all the vaccine trials we saw this past couple of years are examples of this. Um, they are doing the clinical trials, doing the testing. It costs tens of millions of uh, euros to do that. Um, and the candidate drugs that they're testing are, of course, they don't supply them. They're supplied by pharmaceutical companies. Those are the agents. And the agents have knowledge that the FDA doesn't have. They know something about how good their candidate drug is. All right. But if the FDA says, how good is this candidate drug? They're incentivized to not tell the truth. They want to get their drug approved so that it'll go to market. Um, even if it has, it's like sugar water, it has no real effect. All right. And so this is, in fact, what is happening in real life. There are tens of millions of dollars in the U.S. of clinical trials done every year for all kinds of diseases. And it's in part because the FDA has got to test everything that comes in. And, and, and uh, the drug companies are incentivized just to send everything to them. All right, and we can actually make this into mathematics here. Uh, th this is a, you know, an example of an FDA test that they're doing a, st a statistical test and it's you know, nicely calibrated. If you have a drug that's bad, um, meaning not effective, you know, uh, people do not send in drugs that actually hurt people. But if it's not effective, the FDA will approve that with probability less than 0.05 or some even smaller number. That's the, that's the false positive rate. And if a drug is actually good, the FDA will approve it with, you know, maybe 80%. Uh, and so that's the, uh, the the power. So that's a standard optimal Neyman Pearson test. And the FDA is definitely doing tests like this. And the problem is that the, if this is not taking into account the economic side. So if you now look at a real world case where um, a, a drug company stands to make a small profit, you pay $20 million to run the trial. Um, if you're approved, you could make, say, $200 million. Um, and, and so that's kind of a relatively small amount in this world. Uh, and so now you can do a calculation. What's the expected profit if, in, in fact, your drug is not effective? Um, no one knows whether it's effective or not. You don't know. The FDA doesn't know. But you could do the calculation. And it turns out that it's negative $10 million. Um, so the CEO of the drug company would say, oh, well, let's not send in drugs unless we're really quite sure they're, 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 good, they're good ones because we're going to have a negative cost uh, for these drugs. Um, so you only send in your, your favorite candidates. On the other hand, if there's a large profit to be made, so you still pay $20 million to run the trial, and it's $2 billion if you're approved. Uh, so this is more something like ibuprofen or something. If you do that same calculation, you realize you'll make $80 million in expected value. Um, even if the drug is not effective. And this is certainly true. There are many drugs out there that were approved that, that were really basically false positives. They are not effective, but they just were you know, false positives in the test because there's many, many tests being done. All right, so this is bad, and this is kind of what our world is. And so we need to have a, we need to bring economic theory together with machine learning. And so um, let me just say briefly, we've kind of done this in the last year. We have a paper or several papers now on what we call statistical contract theory, and I really am not going to get into the details here, just to say it is kind of a contract like, you know, the airlines, you know, business class or economy class. Uh, the, you have the agent give, been given the following protocol uh, to play the game. They have to pay a reservation price R, like 10 million. Um, they then choose a payout function that is going to depend on a statistical trial variable Z. Okay. And then they receive a payoff, you know, based on the service F and the statistical trial Z. And the principal then receives a utility, which is based on F of Z, but also on theta, because that's the FDA. If the FDA approves a bad drug, uh, eventually people will know about that and the FDA will look bad. So they should have bad utility for that, for that case. All right. So anyway, that is a setup of a contract. And then we have developed uh, 
a mathematical theory that tells us what shape contracts have, what, what form they have. And uh, I'm going to skip the details in the slide just to say, when you start talking about economic incentives, you have to define something called incentive aligned. And so there's a definition of incentive aligned, and it's basically an expected profit. Uh, if the drug is not effective, the expectation of the, uh, the service you have to pay minus the reservation needs to be negative. Um, and then we proved a theorem on the next slide that uh, shows that uh, at the bottom of the page, a, con a contract is incentive aligned if and only if all of the payoff functions, the services, are what are known as E values. And so E values are kind of like P values in statistics, but they're uh, random variables whose expectation is less than or equal to one. Uh, more generally, they're, they're uh, super martingales, non-negative super martingales. Um, all right, so that's a lot of uh, kind of detail there at the end that I didn't explain, but just if you're interested, you'll see in the paper, there's anyway, there's a characterization of statistical contracts, what optimal contracts look like. And so now it's kind of a, you know, a, a design tool. You can start to design contracts based on this characterization and try them out in domains where there's, you know, contracts needed and where uh, there's payments. And so we've been doing this in the domain of federated learning where you have a, a principal who's trying to collect data from a lot of local agents. It's very popular. It's a couple of blogs you can find on the internet. Um, and the work on it so far has not been economic. It, it's, it's assumed the principal can just collect as much data as they want. And the agents are just motivated for some reason to play the game and send in their data. Um, and again, I, I don't think that's a good model of real life. So we were, we're now working on incentivizing data sharing in federated learning. And so we have the agents uh, deciding whether to send data in or not. And so they have something of like a privacy loss, but they have a gain from the, from the overall game they're playing. And we set up a statistical contract to, to uh, ca ca capture all of those phenomena. All right, so I think I'm about finished within a couple more minutes. I have a, a just briefly, I'm gonna just do one minute on uncertainty quantification. This talk was more about economics, but if you're gonna do economics and, and learning together, you have to have good models of uncertainty quantification. And there's this new emerging area on conformal prediction that we've been contributing to. And here are some colleagues, both at Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, and I wanna just briefly say what it is, uh, uh, even though it's not the, the main thread of the talk, but you know, uncertainty quantification is trying to say, here's an output, here's a prediction. How uncertain am I? Or how sure am I of that prediction? And obviously you need that for prediction systems in general, but also if you're going to build decision-making systems, you need it. And if we take a big neural network or big Bayesian system, uh, its outputs are not going to be calibrated. They're not going to be like confidence intervals. And uh, the question is, how do you fix that? And one way is to try to change the training of the network itself. Uh, that's complicated. People have been working on it. It's not, it's not done. It's, it's not. And another way to go is to try to build something called a calibration layer which takes the output of the network and recalibrates those. And conformal methods are a way to do that. And I'm not gonna get into the details of this. Uh, I'm gonna show you on my homepage, I'm gonna point you to a paper where you can look this up. This is doing this in real life. Here, we're trying to predict tumors in images. And um, uh, you can see that the red there is uh, false negatives. You're missing the tumor. The teal or the blue color there are false positive. You're, you're um, seeing tumors where they're not, and there's an intermediate regime where you're not having too many false positives or negatives. And it's very hard to find that intermediate regime because you're really doing now millions of hypotheses tests uh, for every pixel. You're trying to decide whether it's a tumor or not. And so our setup kind of handles that false discovery paradigm in the context of, uh, of conformal methods. Um, and I'm not going to tell you about the calibration procedure, but just to say there's some kind of new concentration mathematics that helps you to get a calibration procedure uh, we calibrated the output of the of alpha fold, which is the protein structure prediction system for from DeepMind. It's a big predictive system that for a protein predicts its structure, and it's very good empirically, but it's not actually giving uncertainty. And if you're you know building, if you're using that system to actually build, you know, consider drug candidates or or build a scientific model, you really would like to have uncertainty. And so we're able to do that. We take the output of their system and calibrate it with our method. And we can now give uncertain predictions of protein structure. And then my last slide, or my nearly last slide, will be um, um, doing this on vision problems. So I'm going to show you a picture of a real life scene, which is being annotated with a neural network. Um, but calibration is being used to give a set valued prediction. 
So you can see that in many cases, we're predicting either car or truck. That's our confidence interval in this discrete space. Uh, we're sure that the entity up to 90% is a car or a truck. We're just not sure which it is. Uh, so the size of the confidence interval is how many labels are being given in that set value prediction. And um, you can see this, you know, really works on, on uh, realistic image, you know, where there's conclusions and so on and so forth. Um, so this is really state of the art. It's uncertainty quantification brought together with, um, with a modern learning system. All right, so let me skip the rest of that. Right, and um, just a couple of final slides to close up. Um, the perspective I'm giving here is, uh, is both science and engineering. You need uh, uncertainty in economic mechanisms, but it's especially engineering. And I think what's happening in our era is machine learning is kind of like a new branch of engineering. So chemical engineering emerged in the 40s and 50s. Before that, there was no chemical engineering. There was chemistry and fluid mechanics. Um, and you knew what to happen when you put molecules together in a lab. But when you started to actually in a fact, you build a factory in a field that you know produced chemical product, um, no one really knew how to do that. And they started trying and building these big systems and they sort of worked and they sort of didn't work. They sometimes exploded. They sometimes just didn't produce product. And, uh, and a field emerged called chemical engineering that was about building systems based on chemistry and fluid mechanics. Same thing for electrical engineering. There was already Maxwell's equations, but then a field emerged that allowed you to build uh, actual devices. And I think what's happening now is that we have primitive principles of inference and algorithms and you know, optimization. And we're trying to kind of build systems like commerce and, you know, and um, transportation systems and, and scientific prediction systems and all. But we really don't have yeah, all the ingredients. We don't know how to put them together very well. We're just kind of building big systems that don't necessarily work very well. And we really need to think of this as a new engineering field. And it's not the field of AI. That's the, the buzzword it's often used. This is not created an artificial human or an intelligence in a computer and hoping that that intelligence solves the problem. It's us kind of thinking about an engineering system and principles that allow us to build that system. Uh, and that system doesn't have to be a single computer. It's a whole federated network, maybe planetary scale. And then the last point is that, as you've seen, I've alluded to, there's three foundational disciplines to, in my mind, not, not only, but these are the three that I think are most important. And they've had pairwise interactions in the past. Economics, computer science, that's algorithmic game theory. Statistics, computer science, that's machine learning. Statistics, economics, that's econometrics. Um, and the point is that all three, oops, all, uh, all that in real world problems that you typically need all three of these disciplines. And that's what I've tried to argue for here today. All right, so thank you. I'm finished with my talk. And if there's time, I'm happy to talk, uh, answer questions. Thank you, Michael, for the